Hi everyone, um, I'm, I'm going to just kick off because uh, it's late in the evening. I know we have a, um, a lot more registered, but um, I won't. I won't hang around. I know you'll all be anxious to to head off to to dinners at the end of all this. So thank you all very much for taking the time out at this hour of the day to participate in this event, and in particular to our speakers who've been given the very unenviable task of summarizing several years of work in some cases or sharing extensive expertise <clears throat> and summarizing that into 10 minute sound bites. So no pressure folks. Just to let you know the presentations being given today will be recorded and the link to those will be shared via the mailing list. So because of this short time frame this evening, we'll run the presentation straight through you can type your questions or comments for speakers into the chat at any time during the event, and we will try to address them all during the Q&A session at the end. If we don't get to them all this evening, if we do have a lot of questions, they will be passed on to the relevant pa panelists for follow up. I hope you all had a big lunch to tide you over now until half past six. So we had, pla had planned to host a muscle industry workshop in collaboration with IFA Aquaculture as part of the Seafood Technical Services um, Programme for 2021. And it was to be an in-person event, but due to the anticipated number of attendees, it really wasn't possible to go ahead with that. Um, as we mentioned in the invitation to the webinar, we plan to revisit that in 2022. But in the meantime, we would like to share some of the work currently going on which is of direct relevance to your sector and those who support it. Much of the work that you'll hear about today has been funded in whole or in part by the European Maritime Fisheries Fund under the Knowledge Gateway Scheme, as has this event. So I'm going to hand you over now to Joanne Gaffney, who is our Aquaculture Technical Manager for BIM Seafood Technical Services Unit. And she's going to give you an update on the National Strategic Plan for Sustainable Aquaculture Development, which covers the period 2021 to 2030. Okay, thanks, Joanne. Um, hopefully everyone can see my presentation now. Um, I'm not going to keep people long. I just wanted to take this opportunity to give everyone an update on where we are with the National Strategic Plan. So many of you are aware but I suppose it's worth going back over um article 34 of the common fisheries policy requires member states to provide a multi-annual strategic plan for aquaculture um in 2014 BIM prepared on a plan on behalf of DAFM to align to the EMFF work program so this time around with MFAF we're doing it again and the new plan will run not just for the funding period of 2021 to 2027, it'll be a plan that covers 2021 to 2030. And it will differ from the previous plan is that it will now align to the new strategic guidelines for sustainable development of aquaculture that were published in April this year. So the structure of the document, it will look at the national context in terms of aquaculture in Ireland, it will look at, it will have a SWOT, it will look at the legislative framework and basically do an overview of where we are. We'll look at the progress that was made under the previous plan. Um, this time around, we'll look at funding opportunities outside MFAF where aquaculture operators could access additional funds such as funding coming from domestic sources such as Sustainable Energy Ireland or funding coming from additional EU programmes such as Horizon Europe. And also a small section looking at transnational cooperation. This time around as well, we're also keen to include an implementation plan which will have periodic reviews and it will keep us up to date and keep everyone aware of where we are with implementing the plan and what progress has been made. Um, the plan is broken into four sections aligned to the strategic guidelines, building resilience and competitiveness, participating in the green transition, social acceptance and increased knowledge and innovation. And that then is broken down into a number of headings. So access to space and water, climate change adaptation, innovation, integration of aquaculture into the local economy. And we have also added a section on human capacity building and training. It wasn't in the guidelines, but we thought it important. 
and as discussed, an implementation and monitoring section. Where we are in the process is we're slightly behind where we thought we'd be at this stage, but we have, we're through stage one and hopefully nearly done with stage two. And I suppose the reason for this talk as well is to say this plan will inform the funding measures that are available to you guys from 2021 or from 2022 now into 2027. So it's very important that when this goes for public consultation, that the industry are aware of it, they have a look at it, they engage with us and you know, give us feedback. Have we missed things that are important to the sector? Are there other things we should be considering? Where should the money be going? What are the projects that should be targeted? Um, this plan will inform those measures and therefore it is important. It'll be a full public consultation. So research institutions, NGOs, other government departments, everyone will be feeding into that consultation. And from a BIM perspective, we very much want to make sure that the sector engages because this is funding that will be going to you. So we will update everyone again when the consultation is being launched. Um, we will try and do information sessions. In fact, we will do information sessions for people if you feel it's appropriate. And hopefully we'll be going to consultation in Q1 2022 before finishing the plan, reviewing submissions, finalizing the environmental report, and then that will feed into the new operational program. Um, thank you very much for your time. And yeah, hope you enjoy the rest of the session. Thank you. That's great. Thanks very much, Joanne, for that update. Um, so most of you already know our next speaker. Um, our next speaker is Teresa Morrissey, IFA Aquaculture Executive. Teresa has a background in environmental science and marine research. She's worked a number of years in the Marine Institute in both the areas of fit in the area of fish health, should I say. And she's been the aquaculture industry representative both nationally and internationally, supporting the improvement and development of the sector since 2019. So she's going to give us um, a summary of the, the work done by the IFA executive um, over the last year, and in particular focus on the seafood task force on which she sat as an industry representative. Thanks over to you, jo or Teresa, thanks. <laughs> Great. Uh, so as Trish said, my name is Teresa Morrissey and I'm the IFA aquaculture executive, and I'm just gonna give you a short update on some of the work we have been doing um, over the past year, some of our priorities and just a particular mention for the uh, Seafood Task Force, which took up a lot of time um, in 2021. Uh, so just a little bit of background, I suppose, again, around IFA Aquaculture is a consolidated group uh, representing all sectors of the Irish aquaculture industry. That's finfish, shellfish and seaweeds. Um, we have a national committee, which is comprised of representatives from all the different um, species. Uh, Michael Malloy, who you'll hear from later, is our current chairman. Um, as Trish already uh, touched on slightly, we had hoped to have our AGM in person um, before the end of this year, um, but of course that wasn't possible with, with the uh, current COVID restrictions and the ever-changing environment around having um, in-person meetings. So we hope to uh, revisit that and, and schedule it for hopefully in-person in February 2022. But if, um, if in-person is not possible, uh, we'll probably go ahead online in February of 2022. So as I said, we represent the interests and concerns of the aquaculture industry um, in Ireland. We support the improvement and development of the Irish aquaculture industry, protection of Irish indigenous aquaculture industry, while promoting the positive aspects of Irish aquaculture. Um, all this is done through strong industry representation nationally and internationally. So just some of our priorities uh, during 2021, and of course, some of these will carry into 2022. Um, Number one, always on the list of priorities is the implementation of aquaculture license and review recommendations. Uh, the current minister has committed to publishing a timeline uh, for implementation. We have yet to see this. Um, also, as part of this, we have regular um, engagement with the Department Licence and Division in Clonakilty. And we actually have a meeting tabled with them for next week. 
Um, and this enables discussion around these uh, licensing review recommendations and other issues. And we are hoping for a comprehensive um, update on the implementation of a number of recommendations that have been progressed in, in Clonakilty um, next week. We had the COVID-19 uh, crisis support we had the COVID-19 uh, Aquaculture Support Scheme this time last year. It was being administered by um, staff and BIM before the end of the year. And of course, some of this carried into the early part of this year. Um, it was worth 1.5 million. And I know um, a lot of rope muscle producers um, were in receipt of that. Um, we had the MSSC classification. Of course, we sit on that, the Molluscan Shelf Safety Committee. You have the, obviously the classification review is an annual event. Um, it was completed in July again of this year, um, again, relevant to a lot of mussel producers there. Um, we do see year on year there's a deterioration of water quality, which then has an impact on the classification review. Um, but we had some favourable results um, again in 2021. Um, we also sit on the CLAMS National Executive Committee uh, for a coordinated local agriculture management system. The strategic guidelines for sustainable EU aquaculture, as Joanne mentioned there just before me, they were adopted earlier this year by DG Santa, the European Commission. And following on from that, we'll have the National Strategic Plan for Sustainable Aquaculture. And Joanne has quite, uh, quite comprehensively uh, pointed out there it's currently being drafted and where they're at with the process. And we look forward to the public consultation on that, hopefully in the new year. And as Joanne, I'd like to reiterate what Joanne said, it's very, very important that, that we all engage with that. And obviously IFA Aquaculture will be proactive in that, in encouraging members to do so, and will obviously be involved in the public consultation process. Uh, marine protected areas, just to bring your attention to that, is something you're going to hear a lot of over the next number of years. There was the first of many, I would imagine, public consultation processes um, in, during the summer. This uh, closed in July of 2021. Um, it's going to be an ongoing process over the next number of years around um, the designation of marine protected areas. In terms of aquaculture, a lot of our activities are already um, either in or adjacent to um, mean protected areas that they being natura sites SACs SPAs so in terms of what will be proposed as new designations not overly concerned but it's something to be aware of there will be new designations I'm sure that will also impact aquaculture and it's just something to be aware of and keep an eye on the national marine planning framework or marine spatial planning as you might have heard of the final plan on that was passed by the Oireachtas during the summer um, the current legislative bill is actually going through the Oireachtas as we speak. It's in the second stage of that going through the Shannon this week. Um, but just to point out again that agriculture is not actually part of the legislative bill. We are part of the National Marine Planning Framework, but we are not legislated for in the bill. Um, what that will mean in the long term, we have yet to see what that will, will, will unfold for us. And just as quick summary on the, the Seafood Task Force, I'll just go into more detail now in a minute. Um, we sat on the, we accepted the Minister's invitation to sit on the Seafood Task Force, attending 14 meetings overall um, every second week from March up until the end of September, participated in numerous discussions, proposals and submissions put forward, which resulted in a 60 million euro aquaculture fund being recommended. So just some of the objectives as they related to aquaculture from the Seafood Task Force um, included uh, increasing the sustainable production of the Irish aquaculture produce, um, creating employment obviously in coastal communities and trying to offset some of the jobs that will be lost in the fishery sector and other ancillary sectors as a result of the Brexit um, deal. Uh, sustaining ancillary services in marine sectors such as marine engineering and seafood processing. Um, for Irish aquaculture production to become a more self-sufficient opera operation, um, looking at uh, investment in, invest in innovation and technology and becoming um, much more self-sufficient in terms of our source of seeds. And um, we are currently kind of more uh, reliant on producers of seed and ova from other, other European countries. And all, doing all this in a in, in way that contributes to uh, meeting climate action targets through carbon sequestration, to our being a carbon efficient food producer, the use of renewable energy sources and creating smart jobs. Um, Investment then would be needed, obviously, in adaptive technology for a more efficient aquaculture um, industry. 
So the Seafood Task Force report then was published in um, October of 2021, and it set out an ambition for a thriving, dynamic Irish aquaculture sector, not limited by quota, has the potential to mitigate some of the damage caused by Brexit through providing opportunities in the seafood sector that would otherwise be lost while creating jobs and economic activity in our coastal communities. The overall, um, I suppose, recommendation that would be relevant to aquaculture was a recommendation of a 60 million euro um, fund for Irish aquaculture that was proposed to come from the Brexit Adjustment Reserve Fund um, and the next EMFAF. Um, as Joanne said, obviously, the National Strategic Plan, I imagine, will, will um, feed into how some of this money could or should be spent from both of these um, funds. And talks are already ongoing as to how we might be able to construct a scheme from the Brexit Adjustment Reserve Fund. Um, the primary um, aim here was to develop Irish aquaculture to mitigate against some of the negative impacts of Brexit that have been most pronounced in other sectors um, of the Irish seafood sector. Uh, by focusing on things like modernization of production sites in line with best international best practice, increasing our resource efficiency and reducing environmental impact, advancing the understanding of market opportunities and innovation capability, and develop technical marketing and management capability. But again, uh, we'll have to wait and see how all this pans out. But as I said, there are ongoing um, negotiation and talks about uh, a scheme from the Brexit Adjustment Reserve Fund, and it's something that we'll be following very, very closely. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Teresa. That's great. Um, it's been a very busy year, <laughs> despite the fact that we've, we've all been chained to our desks to a certain extent. Um, our next speaker is Joan Malloy. Uh, Joan is part of the management team at Blackshell Farm Limited. She has a background in engineering prior to becoming a professional sailor. And Joan has been driving the work being done at Black Shell in collaboration with a Dutch research and innovation company called Senbus Sustainable Products. And they're developing a plant-based biopolymer yarns, which, which can be used in the aquaculture sector. <clears throat> so she's going to share the progress made on this to date. Thanks, Joan. Thanks very much, Trish. I'll just try and... Um share my presentation here uh, now how are we getting on is that um can you guys is that clear perfect yeah yeah great cool well um yeah thanks for the introduction trish and like you said um i work for blackshell farm in westport and I'm just going to talk a little bit today about the work we've been doing with um a biopolymer mesh and its potential use in in muscle farming um, a little bit about Blackshell Farm, if you don't know already about it, um, set up in 1983 by my dad, Michael, and some other partners. Primarily, we're an organic mussel farm in Clue Bay, but we also began producing a cotton a mussel socking in 2010. And that's now you know, another, another important part of our business. And that's really the part of the business that this development has been happening in. Just a little idea, some figures, our annual production of rope grown organic mussels is about a thousand tonnes each year. And in parallel to that, we also produce about 19 tonnes of knitted cotton mesh. And tonnes is a slightly funny unit to be using when you're talking about mesh, but it's um, we produce thousands of kilometres of, of knitted mesh each year from 19 tonnes of, of raw cotton. We have two main products at the moment that we use ourselves on the farm and we, we sell to customers in Ireland and co other customers in Europe and the UK. Um, our, I suppose our, our classic product that we've been making since the very beginning is the New Zealand mesh, um, which we make on some um, knitting machines we bought from New Zealand. And this is a fixed diameter, fixed pattern, um, Low, uh, slightly lower cost is just the product that we've kind of built this business on and primarily nowadays we sell only 100% cotton of this so um, this is 100% cotton mesh and it biodegrades in seawater which is why it's applicable for rope muscle industry and recently just last year 
with the support of BIM, we looked into and we purchased some new knitting machines so that we could expand our product range. And what we have started knitting is a mesh we call Spanish mesh because we bought the machines in Spain. And this is also 100% cotton. The difference here with these machines is they're a lot more sophisticated. Um, they're over 10 years older, uh, 10 years newer than the old machines. And it means we can vary the pattern, the diameter and the width of the mesh. And it also expands the type of yarn we can use, which is very relevant for our ongoing work, trying to source um, other materials to knit with. Um, so this, this yarn for us is a kind of development on, or sorry, this mesh is a development on the mesh we'd always been knitting. And this, these machines have enabled us to look at using different yarn types. So both of these, both of these meshes that we produce at the moment are 100% um, cotton mesh. And we import the mesh or the yarn from Pakistan. Um, where a lot of the cotton produced for the world comes from. And it, there's a couple of questions about, um, like I've said here, the environmental and economic sustainability of doing this, of um, shipping your raw material from halfway across the world. You know, that we, we do it all the time. We're just trying to, to be cognizant of that fact. The fact that it's a long shipping road route, we don't know much about the conditions that the cotton is growing in. You know, no matter how many questions you ask or how many certificates you see, you don't really know what happens um, before, the, before the cotton reaches you. We do know that it uses a lot of water and it uses pesticides in, a, um, in large quantities. So that's um, not particularly sustainable in the long-term view. Also, we need to look at the economic sustainability with the rising cost of fuel and um, so of shipping and then of labour in the regions that it is produced. So this will lead to a price increase of raw material. So all of these factors really had us thinking about how can we make a yarn that is more sustainable um, and that will still fulfill the purpose that we needed to fulfill or perhaps even do it better. So that's where we've been working with this Dutch company that Trish mentioned called Senbis. They are a, a biopolymer experts. So they very scientific based and they develop um, different materials from say different, different yarns and textiles from different um, biological materials. So we've been working with them for two years now on a kind of a, a feedback loop that I've illustrated here. So they've suggested a material that we would use to replace the cotton yarn. Um, and obviously there's a couple of um, characteristics that we need to get right. It needs to be strong enough so that we can knit it and it needs to be strong enough so we can pack it full of muscles like you can see here. But then crucially, it needs to biodegrade in seawater and it needs to biodegrade in seawater on the right timeline. So it can't be too fast or lose muscles and it can't be too slow or it'll clog up the harvesting machinery. So we need to, we've gone through five cycles with them of them producing material. We tested it on our site in Clue Bay and in parallel to that, it's tested in a test facility in Holland at the same time. We feed back results of the tests, if it biodegraded in time or if it needs to be slightly longer biodegradation or shorter, and they go back and tweak the recipe, send us more samples, and we continue that, that loop. And what has been crucial in that loop is the new Spanish knitting machines that we've been using. Um, they mean we've been able to adjust the pattern and the size of the yarn, and also they can cope with the different type of yarn. Um, so it's it's been easier for us to knit. So, what the yarn that they've been um, working on is, is a, it's a biopolymer yarn. It's derived from vegetable starch, potato starch mainly, um, and it's called PLA um, for short, polylactic acid. And for us, we see big advantages are it's produced in Europe. Um, like I said, it biodegrades in seawater. We have now hit on a recipe that is in, in the right timeline. Um, and so we're just going back for the second round of tests now. Um, and that's been, like I said, it's been tested all the time in Holland as well. And 
it can it can be manipulated just like cotton um, the yarn itself almost looks like a plastic it's very strong it's stronger than cotton um, so it it can be handled it's much more resistant to say rough handling on the boat or sliding over machinery or sliding over wheels and things like that so it's we think there's a lot of potential there for it um, it's still very kind of fledgling um, fledgling technology um, so we're hesitant to say it's going to be the perfect solution but we really believe there's a lot of potential for this in the rope and muscle industry um, in the immediate term um, here's just a couple of pictures of it in testing on our site you can see the main picture there the how the muscles have grown through the mesh and it's um, begun to biodegrade away um, to quite a high level so that's that's good far quite far along in the process and you see on the pipe there it's it's very strong stiffer material than the cotton and um, has very strong characteristics the individual yarns so like everything new there's a couple of opportunities and challenges this list is not exhaustive but of course the challenges that we've hit already like loads of people have in covid are the supply chain and the raw material availability you know we're already um it's already taken much longer than we expected to get all of the samples and the yarn um, production to us and the price as well. The price competitiveness kind of remains to be proven. And that's something we're just going to have to work through with the yarn producers over time as we up the production to bigger and bigger quantities. Um, there are some really big opportunities, though, we believe. Um, the first one being there's a range of other uses for um, this material in things like rope netting. And that's something we want to get into investigating straight away. And we think there's dust, there's a potential for its use in the wider aquaculture industry. And that would take away our reliance on the kind of environmentally heavy cotton. And it's an emerging area of science. So you know, every time I look, there seems to be more um, papers emerging on PLA. Um, kind of as a replacement for cotton. So it's an exciting area to be in. And I think the technology will improve as the years go on. And of course, it, it reduces our reliance on environmentally heavy products. Um, I'm sure as you all know, and we're about to hear more about it from Ronan. Um, muscle farming is, in terms of protein production, is a very low carbon way to produce protein. Um, but the carbon footprint of the imported cotton um, is big. So if we can reduce that further, it reduces the grams of carbon per kilos of protein that we produce. So that's great. Great. So that's all I have. If you have any questions, just type them up and we'll try to get them at the end. That's great. Thanks, Amelia and John. Um, yeah, there, there's plenty of questions coming in, which is great. So um, I'll, I'll be passing, handing them over to the panel uh, later on today. So um, as Joan mentioned there, our next speaker is Ronan Cooney. Um, and Ronan is a postdoctoral researcher from NUI Galway, and he's a member of the Moore Fish Research Unit. So since 2015, he's been applying life cycle assessment to aquaculture, fisheries and seafood processing. And his work focuses primarily on developing life cycle assessment data sets and toolkits for seafood products and production systems. So Ronan's going to talk today about the life cycle assessment or LCAs, uh, he may refer to it as in, in his presentation, the LCA work he is doing under the Shell Aqua Pro project, which um, started, I think, at the beginning of this year um, and is, is funded uh, as, a, as a knowledge gateway project um, by EMFF. Um, so over to you, Ronan. Thanks very much. Great. <coughs> Thanks, Ben. So uh, hi, as Trish said, I'm Ronan Cooney. I'm a researcher based at NUI Galway and uh, involved with the Moorfish Research Group. So one of the projects that we're working on at the moment is uh, called Shell Aqua. And the idea behind it is to look at the life cycle assessments and ecosystem services that shellfish aquaculture provide. And for this evening, I'm just going to kind of give a run through of some of the life cycle models and the approaches that we're using for um, rope muscle aquaculture in Ireland. <clears throat> so uh, the Moorfish Group kind of started in 2015. Primarily, we were a uh, Department of Agriculture, Food and Marine funded project looking at freshwater aquaculture. 
And since then, we've kind of changed into a group that looks more at uh, addressing kind of the research gaps and the research needs of, of the aquaculture industry. So primarily how we utilize this is through this life cycle assessment uh, methodology. And Shalakwa kind of came from this project here, which is Neptunus. As we were kind of engaging with producers and processors up and down the country, the one thing that we kept hearing from shellfish producers was we're producing a product, but we're also providing a service. And that kind of, we went away for a while and we had to think about it and saw that we could facilitate that under this life cycle assessment uh, framework. And as part of that, we were able to develop a research program to look at the monitoring the ecosystem services that shell, shellfish aquaculture can provide. So as part of that, uh, and at the moment, what we're doing is we're looking at three different species of shellfish all along the west coast of Ireland. And primarily what we'll be doing is we'll be taking samples in the new year, and we'll be looking at what are the uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, and um, the carbon. Uh, the content in each of the shells and from that and by the end of um, I think the summer next year we should have a toolkit ready to to deploy and be able to share with um, with operators and the idea behind it is to to provide a tangible and applicable outputs for for, for the shellfish sector in Ireland so all this will be done under a life cycle assessment based approach so LCA is also known as uh, life cycle analysis, life cycle assessment, cradle to grave analysis. But it all kind of goes back to this thing, which is an ISO standardized methodology used to assess the impacts of a process, product, or system across its life cycle. So aspects of an LCA that we're probably all familiar with at this stage are carbon footprints, water, and energy footprints. And essentially what it is, is looking at the inputs, the outputs, and the impacts associated with a product. And in this instance, we're looking at, uh, at rope muscles. And why, why it's useful is that it can allow you to compare between products, it can allow you to compare between years, systems. If you decide to make a, a, a change in your process and you can observe through it uh, to see which of the hotspots can produce it. So is a certain type of rope uh, contributing a, a, an, enormous, a, a, an unusual amount of carbon or an impact through my process? So that kind of allows us to, to quantify it and bring it back to a number. Uh, numbers game. So when we look at it in uh, an international context, uh, of course, the first ones to try it out were uh, the Spanish in 2010. And since then, we've seen it kind of go to Brazil, Scotland, Scandinavia, Nigeria. And uh, currently, um, we're just uh, just a little, little bit behind in terms of these data sets. At the moment, uh, there are 11 different studies on mostly LCAs, and there's four on oysters and one from this year, looking at uh, clam production. And altogether, what we're kind of seeing is this is pretty much a, a European kind of focused uh, research area at the moment, but uh, it, it, it ties back into some of the emerging legislation that we're seeing coming down the line, like the Farm to Fork strategy, the, the Green Deal, and more and more, it's, it's, it's kind of a, the EU kind of focusing on increasing the amount of uh, seafood proteins that we consume as part of our diet. So. How is an LCA done? So essentially what we do is we set up a boundary and we see what processes we want to look at. So background processes typically that we look at are the vessel. So the production of the vessel, the maintenance, the operation, paints, repairs, new cranes, engines, all that kind of stuff. We also look at the material side of things. And for rope muscles, we particularly focus on uh, the infrastructure side of things. So anchors, ropes, chains, uh, everything that we can we can think of. Uh, in the energy side of things, we go as far back as looking at the extraction, refinement, and the use and combustion of the diesel on, on site. Then other processes we look at are the culture, processing, shipping, and transportation to, uh, to, a, to a factory. We also look at the waste emissions and also the, the materials, so the waste ropes, waste packaging. Um, but at the moment, what's beyond the scope of our, 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 our capabilities is to look at what happens once it leaves and goes into a factory setting. So hopefully we'll be able to address that in a, in a, in a follow-on project or in a future project. So what does an LCA look like? So this is uh, all the kind of processes that go into you know, producing a kilogram of muscles. So what we're looking at here is kind of like the footprint of uh, CO2 for a kilogram of muscles. 
And it just kind of shows that there, there's a lot going on and there's a lot of processes involved in the background and, you know, a lot of things are linked and there's loops. But ultimately, when we start to break that down, we get something more manageable like this. So as part of this, again, this is a, a kilogram of muscles produced at a site over a five-year period and looking at the CO2 emissions associated with it. Uh, I haven't put figures up, but we're sharing the percentages at the moment because we're still very much going through the process of refining these data sets. But straight away, what we can see here is that fuel and fuel use on the site account for over 50% of the, the, CO, the associated CO2. And one of the, the interesting things that we we're able to see is actually that this, this chain here is the infrastructure and it's particularly the floats. And over on the graph on the right hand side, you can see here in the it's lovely battleship gray, that the muscle floats uh, actually come from almost 25% or 23% of the associated CO2. And pretty much that goes back to the fact that that particular producer uh, focuses on using 100% new material in each of their, their, uh, their floats. Um, and this is where LCA can kind of give a little bit of an insight into the numbers and see, you know, if we were to change that, that uh, material mix to 50% recycled or, or um, virgin material, um, you know, we may have a lower impact, but we may actually have a higher rate of reuse of the materials. So these are some of the things that we can uh, achieve and model as part of uh, an LCA. Um, the next thing as well that we'll be looking at is to just kind of compare and contrast and show how efficient muscle production is, and particularly our Irish muscle production, in, in context and in comparison to other seafood products and other food products, you know, we can, we can bring it up to compare uh, compared with cattle, sheep, you know, dairy, whatever, whatever we, we want really, that's the, the brilliance of LCA. So we can see here that, you know, generally seafood would have a very low energy footprint. Some of the more intensive kind of fishing activities, of course, will have a higher impact, but Overall here, we can see that um, carbon footprints uh, associated with seafood products are, are quite low. Uh, beef often can be multiples of the time of, of, of these, these products. And I suppose this, the reason I've included this, this, tip, this line over here, this is what's called the nutrient-rich food index. And it's where we can assess as part of a food product, the nutrients that are to be encouraged and nutrients to be limited. And what we have in this is we have 12 nutrients that we want to encourage in, in the human diet, and we have two that should be limited. And what we can see here is that, you know, muscles are quite nutritionally rich. And as part of the project, what we'll be doing is we'll be bringing this back and we'll be developing up a, a new kind of a framework, what's called the nutritional footprint. Um, so that kind of brings me up to near, near the end. So I suppose the expected outcomes from this project are, you know, it will be addressing an industry identified knowledge gap, We'll also be transferring a series of toolkits and, and reports and data sets back to the industry. And uh, we'll also be kind of looking at valorization strategies for, for the shell waste as well. Um, so if you want to contact us, our details are up there. If you want to learn more about the Morefish Group, you can visit our website. And uh, just to say thanks to BIM for uh, supporting us through the KGS and also to thank the, the industry partners who um, have supported us this project. Thanks very much. That's great. Thanks. Thanks, Roman. Oh, we have a, a kind of an engaged tone going there for some reason. I don't know if it's coming from, from you, Roman. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, okay, so, uh, so we now have Michael Malloy from Blackshell Farm. Um, Blackshell Farm again so is going to give us some insight into the current issues facing the French mussel industry following his participation in an industry conference over, over in France last week. Um, I believe there were there was at least one other mussel farmer there as well. So um, Michael, um, as most of you would know already, is the managing director of Blackshell Farm Limited, um, which, as Joan said, is primarily an organic rope mussel farming operation, um, but also uh, manufactures and supplies biodegradable cotton mesh. Um, but he's also the chairman of the IFA Aquaculture Committee and um, an indus the industry representative on ALAB as well. Um, so anyway, I'm going to hand you hand you over to Michael now. Thanks very much. 
Okay, well, thanks very much for the invitation today. Now, unfortunately, I have no slides, so I'm just going to see my face or see my head and make uh, the best of that. Um, but I was fortunate enough to uh, attend a conference in um, La Rochelle, and uh, the other producer, I don't think you mind me saying it, is Colin Hooley from Royal Water Bay. Um, it was basically it was organised by the CRC. Uh, that's the Committee Regional Coaching. But I would never hard to say this word, but the shellfish regional shellfish committees of Charlotte Maritime and Pays de la, de la Loire, which is basically the west coast of France. Um, so that's a it's a well established mussel growing area. The best known brands would be Charon, uh, would be the the best known brand of mussels coming from that area. So uh, mussels in that area, they call it the sounds, the sounds uh, between Ile de Ray and Ile d'Orléans, uh, between them and the mainland, they are the main producing areas. They're also massively important for um, oysters. So basically they're, um, the French industry is navel gazing and they're uh, trying to make predictions for how the industry will um, endure or how it will survive until at least 2030. And so they divided the seminar up into six different areas, six different uh, parallel workshops were going on. Well, sorry, three in the morning and three in the afternoon. Uh, I was involved in two of them, uh, but the six main topics were, uh, it was long line innovation, which was uh, basically um, trying to get the European experiences, which is the reason that uh, Irish industry representatives were there, and also we had uh, John and Nikki Homeyard from Offshore Mussels in Lime Bay were also there to give their experiences with offshore mussel farming. Um, there is a mussel long line growing industry in the, this area. It's um, it's very different to the industry that we have developed here. It's traditional. It's um, very high labour uh, content. It's uh, moderately exposed, but it's and it's low tech. It's um, it's uh, not that well developed, but at the same time, it is an important part of the industry, and they work it in parallel with their bushel farms, and they get some. There is some. You can see the logic behind the two just systems run in parallel, but at the same time, their costs per kilo produced are uh, a lot higher than ours are. But then again, their sales price is a lot better than ours. So they, that was one topic was long line innovation. The second topic was climate change and productivity and understanding and mitigating for the associated problems. And this is a real issue in uh, France. Um, they're feeling, they're far more aware of climate change than we are. They have um, extreme heat events. They have problems with uh, survival, especially on Bouchot areas. Uh, and they also have bigger winds and heavier storms than they had in the past. So this is really is causing problems there, and they're um, they are they are, are concerned about it, and they are really are scratching their heads on this. Um, and this is one reason why productivity or production has dropped in these two areas of the west coast. There's approximately ten thousand tons of mussels grown every year uh, for what looks like a huge industry, but um, that is their, their productivity is about the same size as the Irish industry, but an awful lot more people employed. So the um, the other area that was looked at, was examined, was uh, quality labelling. This is nothing new for anybody involved in BIM or the Certified Quality, Aqu certified quality Aquaculture. Um, I see some of the people are participating from that area. Um, very important in France, you got big labels, the uh, Mont Saint Michel label is a huge one for um, mussels, and you got the Gilardo for oysters. And so, quality labeling is a massive topic in France, and it's a way that they can protect their industry, and it's something that they're very interested in doing. And they don't want imports from the likes of Ireland or from anywhere else undermining their um, local quality brands. So, the second workshop that I was involved in was ex expansion and diversification. And a lot of this would talk about offshore um, operations. Uh, I presented slides and 
uh, insights from visits I'd made in various countries, New Zealand and Canada and uh, the UK and our own experiences here on the west coast of Ireland, which they obviously found interesting. They found it particularly interesting the way you could crank up productivity by applying different methods. Um, they have natural uh, challenges that would probably mitigate against the um, expansion and diversification offshore in France. They have a massive tidal um, currents which uh, make it very difficult to um, keep ropes sunk in the water. They've tried um, mussel farming in the Channel, in the British Channel, off Dunkirk, and they had a huge problem trying to keep the stuff there and keep the mussels actually deep enough in the water was their biggest challenge. Um, so they're quite skeptical. Uh, there was good conversation after it, and they're generally met with skepticism. Um, just wondering how they could possibly anchor stuff there and also the difficulty of the marine spatial planning, which of course Theresa was talking about, and which is a huge area in our country here. Uh, the uh, strength of the fishing industry there is huge. The uh, number and strength of the marine leisure activity is massive. Offshore sailing, as Joan will tell you, um, is huge there. So they saw the actual zoning of offshore areas for aquaculture to be a bit of a to be a huge challenge so there was also a workshop done on water quality which is of critical importance as we know ourselves but in france it's becoming a, an increasingly a problem they have higher and higher levels of bacteria that they're finding in their in their stock uh, which is causing mortalities there's higher levels of agriculture runoff you can actually see it you know, clearly the amount of um, mud and silt accumulating in the growing areas is absolutely massive. So this is a, a huge area for them. And there's a separate workshop on that. I wasn't, didn't attend that, but this is just, again, the key issues that are concerning them. And the um, then the other part that like what Ronan alluded to was they see the opportunities in the zero carbon, zero waste, and the opportunities that arise from that. Now, this is it. I think that we need to seize on ourselves um, mussel farming is really well placed uh, from all the environmental standards. It, it, you know, it, it, it uh, matches and exceeds uh, our other food sources from that point of view. It's a, a, and it's something that we need to um, promote and actively. <clears throat> so that's really what is a snapshot. Um, it was really interesting and they were very welcoming. Uh, and we've a lot to learn from them and they seem to think they've a bit to learn from us and i think it's nice to develop a relationship with uh, another aquaculture stronghold is the only way you could describe france uh, it's also really interesting how well and how well their the representative organization works and the influence they have in in how their industry works the industry really does lead the charge rather than sitting back waiting for um the state to actually do it for you which has been what industry tends to do here so it's um that's really yours that's they're my insights um thanks very much everybody Thanks, Michael. I think there's a, a lot of a lot of food for thought there, um, and maybe maybe there'll be a little bit of discussion about it later on um, in the Q and A. As I said um, earlier on, everybody, you're very welcome to post any comments or questions um, to any of the panelists um, on the Q and A, which is just at the bottom of your screens there. And you can also post it anonymously. I, I think um, if you if that suits you better. So. Um, we we're turning again back to to BIM now and um, Richard Donnelly who's well known to most of you is the salmon and shellfish manager in our development and innovation services unit and um, under his current remit he has among other things been responsible for innovative projects such as the aquaculture remote classroom and taste the Atlantic a seafood trail um, both both projects, I suppose, which try and promote Irish seafood, as, as Michael was alluding to in his presentation. Um, 
and both have contrib contribute to raising the profile of Irish aquaculture in terms of its benefits and the quality of the products produced. So Richard is also our main link to board BIA <laughs> and is going to give us an update on European muscle market trends this evening. Thanks, Richard. That's great, Trish. Uh, thanks very much. Good evening, everybody. Um, what I'm going to do is just go through some slides in a minute. I'm going to be glad to know it won't be about 40 or 50 graphs. It'll just be a little snapshot of what's going on in the European markets. I just want to sort of look at historically what's happened in the last year, really taking it up to September. Uh, the data I'm presenting here would be Eurostat trade data, which, again, I always take with a little bit of caution. They're not, it's not an exact science of how they gather the data and how they present it. But the main thing is to look at the trends and to see what we can garner out of that from a market and marketing uh, perspective. So I'll just kick off uh, now with uh, just the, uh, the first of the slides up here. Okay, so I just want to, first of all, just to give you an idea of uh, global production. Is that loaded up yet? I think we I think we lost it. It was there, but it wasn't. Yeah. There we go. That's the end. That was quick. Okay. I hope you enjoyed <laughs> that. Yeah. Just want to put okay. it in yeah. Yeah. then full screener. Yeah, there we go. Okay. So just to recap, I was uh, again this data is it gets taken with a bit of pinch of salt, but really what you do is just want to get a, a scale of where we are in the overall global production. Uh, you can see up around 250,000 tons, 200,000 tons out of Spain, similar but slightly less out of Chile. Uh, and it's it's really just to see where we are in the global uh, sphere in our terms of production. And that's why it's so important that we get the data back from you guys um, with the annual survey that we do every year, because it does give us, it's the only really insightful information that we get about production. And you can see here that the rope muscle production from 2017, 18, 19, up to 20, we've had that growth. It's not dramatic. We're going from sort of just over eight, 9,000 uh, up to sort of heading about 11,000 in 2020. And again, that survey is going to be conducted uh, later on this year. The, as you can see, more turbulent issue in the bottom muscle industry there, you're getting a lot of variation, but where we are in that sort of four to 5,000 sphere is where it's going to stay for the next couple of years based on the seed surveys <clears throat> on the seed settlement over the last couple of years. So that just gives you a sort of scale of the industry. So the latest data, which is up to September, 2021, it just to illustrate the main markets that we are, and it was great to see Michael over with our French colleagues because they are by far the most important market for fresh mussels. And unfortunately, the trade statistics do not separate between rope and between bottom mussels. Uh, so we look to the category just of fresh mussel exports. And you can see France is 54% uh, of the overall exports in 2021. It's amazing. It does vary year to year the netherlands do come in and out and do take more market share it's usually related to production in the uh, bottom muscle industry but that's been quite uh, relatively stable for the last number of years so it's the fresh muscle market in france that's most important uk has dropped significantly and we'll see that just in the next graph and um, there's been a significant drop oh, but on the processing side uh, process muscles to the uk have actually increased uh, so there's there's still retail opportunities there for processed mussels getting into the UK, despite uh, we haven't really hit the import uh, regulations, but there is transit um, issues there getting into the UK. And you can just see the uptick there uh, for the French production there. And this is up to September, comparing September with each year, those previous years, rather than comparing just an annualized uh, uh, volume. Okay, just to give you an insight into what's imported into these countries, just to look at what our competitors are, because these are the other countries that are uh, selling mussels. So in the Netherlands, up to September this year, Germany supplying 32%, Denmark 38%, and Ireland at 14% of the imports into the Netherlands there. So again, we're not the number one there. They are still relying on Germany and Denmark. And we'll talk about that just a, a little while and maybe some market opportunities. Obviously in France, it's the 
cheaper uh, basically products of Spanish muscle coming in 57%, and then the higher value uh, processed muscle, which is basically packed. Uh, it could be fresh as well from the Netherlands, and then our product coming in. So it's about 30,000 tonnes so far to 2021 imported into France, of which Ireland is contributing 9% of that. And the total imports into the Netherlands, because of obviously their own domestic production, is much lower at 14,000 tonnes. Let's just have a quick analysis of what's going on in these markets in terms of trends. Uh, first of all, looking at the imports into the Netherlands, you can see this dramatic drop in the German imports. The fishery, the bottom muscle fishery in northern Germany there has had a significant reduction in the actual catch going in. Um, this is not the only reason, but certainly one of the reasons contributing to the um, sort of higher prices that we've seen achieved in the European markets this year. The Irish, again, slightly less production. We've been shipping more to France. Um, and therefore there's been a slight drop up to 2021. But again, you've got to look at this only till August. So it's going to sort of be a little bit of uptick on that. And it's probably be remain roughly around just below that 5,000 tonnes. Uh, the Dutch have looked to Denmark this year to supplement that drop uh, in production from Germany. So they've been importing more. The muscle yields have not been fantastic from either Germany or Denmark. We've had very good muscle yields um, in terms of the meat count going into um, the Dutch market. And that's, again, been another reason why we've been achieving stronger prices this year. So let's just look at those prices. There's the German price coming in there. Again, this is the imported price into the country, including of everything. So don't take this as this is the exact price. What you're looking at is trends um, here. And as you can see, with our, we've had a very good year of exporting into the Netherlands there with, with strong prices. Um, but again, the demand has also been quite strong from Denmark, but they're not achieving as strong a price as us. And that's mainly due to the, uh, the meat content yields that we've been getting in our muscles this year. Again, it's predominantly bottom, bottom muscles going into the Netherlands. So let's look at the French market. So first of all, they take a huge volume from Spain. Um, it's, as we noted there, that is the main uh, product that is imported into France in the fresh mussel area. And they've had a drop in the volume coming in from the Netherlands. Uh, there's been a shortage of supply really in the Netherlands and therefore they're probably retaining that supply for themselves. And then we can just see where the Irish volumes uh, slip in here. And we talked about that earlier in the percentage that we contribute. So finally, we're just going to look very quickly at the price point. As I mentioned earlier, the Spanish market is very much focused on that lower cost muscle, high volume, uh, fresh muscle, get it up from uh, the Vigo, uh, the Gabra Brincialis muscle there ship it in, it's used in a lot of processing, but also on the fresh market there. Um, and the volumes have been quite, quite steady, uh, or the price has been quite steady in at around that 700 mark. As you can see, when they import from the Netherlands, they are taking that packed product, finished product. It could be fresh, but it could be in an MAP packaging or just ready to go on retail sales because the processing will be done in Ursiga uh, and shipped into, into France. And then we see the Irish, and as I mentioned earlier, we've had that strong uplift in price. Um, a number of reasons for this. Um, it's been a interesting year in all seafood categories. We've seen very strong prices um, on shrimp. We've seen very strong prices on salmon. We've seen very strong prices. So the consumer demand for high quality, good product um, has driven up all seafood prices in Europe this year for the, the vast majority of products even though the main outlets have been retail, but as food service began to open up, there was very strong demand. Unfortunately, obviously that has gone into slight decline now as we moved in the last couple of months uh, with the closures in, in some European countries of the food service outlets. But when they were open, there's been there's a real pent up demand for high quality value seafood. And obviously with the good growth that we've had here in Ireland, good meat contents, there's been very strong demand 
and it's been reflected in the strong prices there that we've seen. So what I'm going to do is just do a little bit of uh, gazing into the future for 2022 and um, try not to be too pessimistic um, and have a look at what are the concerns and what is going on in not just the muscle industry because we're part of the seafood market, it's to actually look at everything in context. Every seafood operator um, from Thailand to Scotland, um, we're looking at increased running costs. Labour costs have gone up, fuel costs, we all know the situation with the oil, we've all been to diesel pumps, we see it in gas, we see um, the huge costs that is running um, uh, facilities uh, such as uh, cold storage and things like that, and also logistics, um, which has really uh, been a major problem for everybody, just container traffic and road traffic and even sea freight as well. And I'm not afraid, I hate to mention it, but Brexit hasn't gone away and we are going to see a significant impact as we go through, first of all, with the notifications that will come in on January the 1st for loads going to the UK and transiting the UK, and then the further regulations that will be happening uh, in November 2022. This is going to slow down things. We've said it before, and I know everybody's tired of Brexit and the impacts, but from a logistics point of view, it is going to slow things up. It is going to make it more costly, and it is going to have some impact, even of us using the land bridge uh, to transit through the UK to get to the European markets. So uh, it, it really is um, it's an issue that's not going away, and it is adding to that bottom line cost. There is increased imports. Again, the strong market demand in France, as um, the Spanish talking to a couple of people there, they're looking to develop further into that French market. And the Chileans are also looking at some value added products to capitalize on that increased pent up demand uh, that is happening in all European markets for seafood, um, but particularly in France for uh, mussels, both processed and fresh. But I, my feeling is that this pent up demand will continue despite the sort of bumps in the road that we're experiencing at the moment with the, the COVID uh, epidemic and the, the, the closures and things like that. But there is pent up demand there for high quality, high value products. And we haven't really seen that resumption of the food service sector. So my prediction for next year, I think that will become strong. I think we've had very good um, activity in the food, in the retail area. And the retail area has actually performed extremely well in every country uh, in Europe and in the UK uh, for all seafood products. So if you look at the salmon industry, for instance, the volumes of salmon released into the market, into the European market from Scotland and from Norway have been the highest ever on record in September and October uh, from any other year and the price has been the highest that has been achieved. Now, that's saying something that there is definitely, you know, demand there. There's a market opportunity for seafood. Uh, the consumer is voting by actually buying it and paying those higher prices. But it tends to be the high quality, high value products that are actually performing the best. So really that is, again, the areas that we're, we're hoping to target. So it's a quick run around Quick sort of overview. I do have more in-depth statistics on this. Um, as again, the uh, thing is recorded, the presentation is recorded, and you can look back on those that data there. Again, it does change from month to month um, as Eurostat refine it, but I just wanted to give you an overall feel and trend and sort of outlook that is on one good hand and bad hand uh, for 2022. So, and I'd be happy to take the questions at the end there. Uh, we'll go to the panel discussion. So thank you very much for that. And I will hand back to Trish. Thanks a million, Richard. Um, okay, so our, our final speaker this evening is Damien Haberlin. Um, he's a postdoctoral researcher in MARA UCC, which is Science Foundation Ireland's research center for energy, climate, and marine research and innovation. So Damien has, um, Prior to, to this current work that he's doing, he's carried out applied research in the salmon industry on mitigating the impacts of jellyfish on caged salmon. And most recently, he's been working on the feasibility of offshore mussel farming in Ireland. And that's, uh, that project is being funded again under the, 
the um, Knowledge Gateway Scheme um, from the EMFF funds. So um, there are many aspects to this project, including the mapping of resource constraints to developing offshore bioeconomic modeling, um, and there are the field trials. And that is what Damien is going to talk to about, talk to us about today. Okay, thanks, thanks Damien. Uh, <clears throat> thanks very much, Trish, for the introduction and um, hello to everybody. Uh, watching, I'll just uh, share my screen now. So as Trish said, uh, the WAM project is uh, broadly concerned with the feasibility of offshore mussel aquaculture, which is essentially push, pushing out into not necessarily deeper, but certainly more exposed waters. This particular work, I guess I'll present tonight is maybe concerned with the technical feasibility and trying to understand the loads uh, and the strain that is actually the, the gear has to endure to survive in an exposed location. And there's a very good reason for trying to get this kind of information. And that is a, it's simply, it doesn't really exist. There's a real paucity of literature on this topic. And, and if you look at sort of aquaculture and aquaculture engineering, the vast majority of it revolves around salmon aquaculture and um, Thin fish cages. So, with that in mind, um, oops. Uh, Trish put us in touch with uh, Finian O'Sullivan and Bantry Harbour Mussels. And we chose uh, a site in Snov, which is uh, marked by the red circle in the bottom left. Maybe if I just turn on a, a laser pointer. So, this is Snov. And you can see that Snov has a line of sight directly out to the mouth of Bantry Bay. So according to the guys who work there, they experienced some pretty big swells. Although up to, up to this sort of data gathering exercise, we, we, did, we didn't have any quantification of that swell. So our number one tool in trying to understand the load on the systems is, is this load shack over here on the right. And you can see there's a stainless steel pin running through it. So any pressure that's put on the pin is translated into a signal and the signal goes to uh, the control box here, which has uh, essentially a little microcontroller. And that turns it into uh, consumable data for us, like essentially an Excel sheet with rows of timestamped uh, information. So just to clarify exactly how we were using it, it was put in the head rope of the line. And this is a, a slightly idealized schematic of the line in Snov. You've got uh, four clump weights at each end. You've got a bridal system. The bridal is actually a little closer to the surface, probably more like up here than what I have in the drawing. But we had a load shackle here at the most exposed end and a load shackle at the other end. So this is a 220 meter long line. And this is typical of the muscle lines in Snov and the muscle lines that are run by Bantry Harbour Mussels. In practice, this is what the system looks like. Again, the load shackle here. So when the guys pulled up the rope, what they did is they took a bite out of the head rope, which is the kind of the dirtier looking rope you can see here. They took a bite out of that and then installed the shackle into that bite. So when we release the whole system now, all the load running through the head rope is coming onto the shackle. Um, the little control box I showed in the previous slide, we put inside a PVC container here just for extra protection, but it also made it easier to attach it to the top of the float. So this was all fantastic. Everything was going swimmingly. And we set this out for three months. So they, the control box is sampling at 20 hertz. That's uh, 20 samples every second. And uh, the control card could carry about three months of information. So we, we left the system out for about three months. And when we went to download, retrieved and downloaded the first batch of data, we discovered uh, that some of the data was not great. In fact, it, it looked like gibberish, to be honest. Um, the load was oscillating between minus and plus eight tons. So clearly something had gone wrong somewhere. And then as luck would have it, the second system we put out uh, went missing. So uh, fortunately, we kept one shackle in reserve just in case of uh, such a mishap. 
And that was, that was put out in uh, July of 2021, this year. And we managed to get some good data from that. So what you could see here is starting from July uh, up to mid-August. What's interesting about this graph is the peak here at the very beginning. This is, this is literally us lifting the head rope with the crane. So you can see it's going up to 700 kilograms of strain running through the head rope. And at this initial portion from the 1st of July up to approximately the 15th, the line was empty. And, but then the lad started to seed it. So you can see the step change in the system as the seed is being applied. And also some of these additional peaks here are probably the system being worked on and being lifted by the crane as well. So you can see if I zoom in on the middle section here from say July 15th up to approximately August 15th, we get something like this and you, you start to see there's a periodicity in the data and it's oscillating up and down around a kind of a mean value of about maybe 220 kilograms. So if I zoom in even further on the, the box, uh, the data under the red box, you get to see this much more detailed picture emerging. And what you're seeing in this periodicity is actually the tidal signal. So the, uh, the red box indicates a falling tide. So the strain or the load running through the head rope is actually decreasing as the tide is ebbing. And then it's starting to increase again as the tide is flooding. Now this particular graph here is probably somewhere in between a neap and a spring tide. So we might anticipate that this would change um, as you move between those two. And as you apply more load and more floats to your line. And so an, an additional piece of information that we wanted to collect then was wave data as well. So we didn't just want the loads by themselves, we wanted some indication or some record of what the environment is doing at the time. Uh, so we worked with the Marine Institute and the SEAI to put out a wave buoy. Um, that went out a little bit after the shackle this year. So the shackle went out in, um, or sorry, the wave boy went out before the shackle. The shackle went out in July, uh, the wave boy went out in June. So you can see the bungee cord here. So the wave boy is attached to the bungee cord and it's oscillating up and down. And this is recording data also at a very high frequency, sub-second. And it is sending data back to uh, a base station at Bantry Pier. However, the data going back to the base station is summary data. It's, it's a summary of every half an hour. So we have to wait until we actually get physically out to the boy and remove the SD card to get the full resolution information. However, we did get some information and we had a very benign August and September, as you can see here, um, that's centimeters on your Y axis. So that's a meter and a half up here. So you can see there's, there's almost no wave energy really is very, very low energy. However, I did go onto the system this morning and download um, the latest sort of tranche of information from the boy. And you can clearly see the signature of Storm Barra over the last few days. And that's probably peaking at over seven meters. So that's really high. Um, to get a better view of the data, we'll have to go out and download it, as I said. But So this is really important information and tells us something about the peak loads that uh, your typical muscle line has to endure. But it's no good just having the information by itself. So we worked with uh, Impact9 and John Fitzgerald to use all the data we had gathered to construct um, a computer-based model and I'll just run that here. And so what you can see is as the colors change in the model, what you're seeing is the different strain or the different tension running through each element of the model. Um, this is tension in Newtons. So if you divide by approximately 10, it's kilograms. So if you see along the head rope, it's frequently in the green part of the spectrum, which is approximately, 120 up to 300 kilograms. And that's really, that's closely aligned to what we've seen in the actual measurements from the load boy. And John had constructed this model um, using as much data as we could collect from the Bantry line. So we, we put in 
like very accurate information on the floats, on the buoyancy, on the thickness of the ropes, like each particular piece of rope, the head rope, the mooring lines, um, the elements of the rope between each float and the head rope. And we tried to quantify as best as possible the, the specific weight of actually the muscle line. But crucially, John built this muscle, this model before we fed in the real data, and it was still really close to the actual data. So what we're now focused on doing is using the real data to improve this model even further. And as well as helping us understand what a contemporary system is doing and how it's absorbing the natural energy of the ocean, hopefully this will allow us to sort of maybe scale up or look at a system in a different area with even more exposure. So we didn't just do that. We also looked at uh, a novel system, which would replace the floats with a single beam uh, floating system. And I'll just play this for you. So this is, uh, this is the brainchild of uh, Josh Fitzgerald in Impact 9. And his idea is to get rid of the pre-tensioning that's required on your traditional line that you can see on the left and to replace it with a single beam. So you would reduce your anchoring re requirement. And oh, I can't stop it. So this is us actually constructing a, a prototype in Marai. So this, this material is butyl rubber. It's um, So what we were doing, I'm sorry, I can't actually stop the video. What we were doing in Marai was trying to test that beam. Oh, here we go. I'm just going to go back a second. So this is butyl rubber. This is the same material they used in fracking. So it's extremely tough. And Inside in the tube, what you had is a series of bladders or cells. So inside in the tube, you have a combination of water pressure and air pressure. And these tubes that you can see here are feeding the water and air into the big tube. And this is in the Lear tank down in Marae. And what we were doing here is doing a bend test. So we're using these, these again are uh, load cells. So they're measuring the actual load on the beam itself. And you can see as we're, we're pulling the beam sideways. So the whole idea here is to get, a, to get some idea of what, what kind of stress and how much this beam will bend, depending on how much stress you put on it. This is the whole system collapsed down. This is literally everything. Uh, so it's quite collapsible. And so the whole idea here, I guess, is oops. The whole idea here is to test a novel system and to see, is it better than the contemporary one? And would it be useful in a more offshore location? And can we expand into dif different formats? Uh, for instance, like you can see here with this beam technology. And again here, so that's where we are right now. And in terms of, I suppose the next few months, the project will run up till June. What we're focused on is, uh, as I mentioned, we had issues with one of the load cells in Bantry. And uh, we're focused on repairing that, the actual control box. We're substituting our own kind of in-house control box. So we will continue to leave uh, load cells in the Bantry area and the Bantry line um, in the new year. And we will continue to collect data from the wave boy. So we'll update the model that John has constructed. And we're actually going down there on the next week to collect the card, collect the data off the wave boy, and to collect more data from the load cell itself. So we'll have the loads from the storm barra, and we'll be able to upgrade, update the model using that data. Um, so I think I'll leave it there. Um, there, sorry about that. And, um, 
that's great. Thanks, Damien. Uh, sorry about that. I, <laughs> I had trouble pausing my video. <laughs> No, no, not at all. They, I, I think um, the the message was the message was got across anyway. Um, yeah. It was interesting. It was interesting to see that that model um, in action. Um, so thank you very much to all of the speakers. Um, I think we did pretty well on time. Um, there's still some time for for questions, and there's quite a few in the Q and A box. So if um, if all the panelists would just switch on their cameras.